Let me welcome our audience, the normal audience, to our preaching series. It's called the African American Preaching Legacy Series. And I started the series because there are so many African American voices that are not uh, archived, mm -hmm. as uh, so much of the genius of African American preaching goes to the grave with those preachers. Sure. I simply uh, started with um, Dr. Jeremiah Wright and Dr. Otis Moss Jr. just kind of picking these voices and putting them on tape so that we could have it for posterity and it's picked up and I've interviewed a whole lot more people and so I was in Memphis, Tennessee and a young person, a young millennial walked up to me and said, I love your series, it's a wonderful series, when are you gonna do some millennials? <laughs> and then I asked the question, well, if I were going to do millennials, how would you suggest? He said, well, I don't know about, you know, kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Why don't you get a panel of millennials and just talk about preaching? And then I said, who would you like to be on the panel? And um, the four of your names came up right, bing, 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 bing. So I checked my sources. I checked y'all out. You know, um, and they validated that you all were just gifted and would represent well. So um, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you a question. We're gonna start the discussion, but this is what I want our audience to know. Uh, I did not invite these gifted preachers to try to explain to us how to reach millennials, how to explain to the older generations how to reach millennials. I invited them because they're powerful preachers and they preach and they think about preaching and feel about preaching and do preaching and read preaching. And, and so that's why we're here. And um, I'm very, very interested uh, in what millennials are thinking about preaching. But I certainly don't want you all to give us a lesson on how we can bring millennials. No, let's just let things flow. Thank so <laughs> where I think I want to start is I, I, I want to give each of you a couple minutes or so to tell folks uh, about yourself. And um, this is Dr. Charlie Dates, Dr. Brianna Parker, Dr. Michelle Guidry, and the Reverend Willie Francois. And that's as much, and what would you like um, the audience to know about you? My name is Charlie Dates. I serve as the senior pastor of the Progressive Baptist Church in Chicago. <laughs> and what's unique about that to me is uh, that I am the youngest senior pastor thus far in that church's rich 100 year history. And as we turn 100, I'm reminded uh, by the legacy membership, a wonderful church in Chicago. Uh, I'm reminded of the historic space that that church occupies and the tremendous responsibility I have to carry it into further into uh, the millennium. And I went to school, undergraduate uh, degree in speech communication and rhetoric at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Master's of Divinity at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield. After that, uh, I began serving as the preaching assistant to uh, Reverend James Meeks, who is, has the distinct honor in Illinois of being not only uh, a pastor of a wonderful church, but the first independently elected state senator in the state's history. Mm -hmm. And he did that as a pastor. Uh, so the nexus for me, although it started early on, was concretized, crystallized by his ministry uh, to see the, the web of the gospel and issues of justice and fighting systemic uh, injustice. I also served with Pastor K. Edward Copeland while I was in divinity school uh, at the New Zion Baptist Church in Rockford, Illinois, where so much I, I felt parented in a real sense in ministry by he and his wife, uh, Starla, there. And then uh, after, while at Salem, I started a PhD program in historical theology, which I made it through by the grace of God. Um, <laughs> I'm glad it's over, never going back no more. Um, but I, my focus and my interest in writing is around black church in Chicago and around African-American preaching therein. Mm. And so we've got a couple of legends, a number of legends there that need to be written about. And that's kind of my sense of a burden there. So I'm married to the prettiest woman in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. Her name is Kirstie Elizabeth Dates, and we are the proud parents of Charlie Edward II and Claire Elizabeth. I am Nichelle Guidry. I'm the daughter to Theodore and Della Guidry of San Antonio, Texas, my hometown. I'm sister to Theo III and Chloe, 
and auntie to Sharif and Sloan and Henry. Um, I lead with those relationships because they are probably the most formative building blocks of who I am. Um, before any other call or any other, other degree, was, there was my family. So I'll start there. Um, I am currently serving as the Dean of Sisters Chapel and the Director of the Wisdom Center, which stands for Women and Spiritual Discernment of Ministry at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. I, um, I also strongly identify with my cultural heritage. I am a black woman. Um, I am a daughter to the men, the women, and the children who were stolen from the shores of Africa and traversed the waters of the Atlantic to, into diaspora um, as slaves who rose up over generations to become the abolitionists and the orators and the freedom fighters and the resistors whose blood is running in all of our veins. Um, I'm a daughter of the black church. I'm a scholar. I received a Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communications and Religious Studies from Clark Atlanta University, a Master's of Divinity from Yale Divinity School, and my PhD in Homiletics um, from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary um, in 2017, where uh, my dissertation dealt with uh, preaching and sexualized violence and womanism um, and tried to kind of construct a, a homiletical theology by which we could use preaching to subvert rape culture rather than reinforce it through our preaching. Um, and that being said, I want to thank you, Dr. Thomas, for convening us um, and for curating this panel and for seeing the value in our millennial voices and our millennial ministries to make it into this legacy series. Um, it's an honor to be here with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. I also want to thank you uh, for, for gathering us uh, today uh, to talk about uh, something that is so sacred. Uh, I think black preaching is probably one of the, the greatest things born on American soil. It's the greatest gift, one of the greatest gifts we've given uh, to this nation and to the world. And so to be able to talk about it uh, in, in ways uh, that are deeply personal and hopefully formative uh, I, I, is, is a deep honor uh, for, for me. Uh, I'm Willie Dwayne Francois III. Uh, I am a native of Galveston, Texas. Uh, I currently serve as the senior pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church in Pleasantville, New Jersey, about six miles, five, six miles from uh, Atlantic City, the uh, entertainment capital of the Northeast, uh, <laughs> baby Vegas. Uh, and so uh, I uh, did a bachelor's at Morehouse College. I earned a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School. Uh, both of those experiences were, were formative for uh, my own sort of theological imagination. Uh, uh, developed some great mentor peer relationships there that have been formative for the type of uh, ministry uh, I do, the type of ministry I feel called uh, to do. Uh, I'm currently working on a um, doctor of ministry at Emory uh, University. I'm in my second year uh, there. I'm the uh, president of the Black Church Center for Justice and Equality, the new president of uh, the BCC. Uh, and the BCC is a policy advocacy organization and theological think tank, uh, really just interested in uh, building black power through black faith, uh, reclaiming uh, the revolutionary edge of, of black Christianities. Uh, and what I love about it is that I often think uh, through the Black Church Center, I'm able to practice brush harbor spirituality over against plantation religion. Uh, and so we, we really just want to connect. Uh, we try uh, to connect uh, uh, congregations uh, to resources that, that shape policy, uh, that shape uh, uh, the conversation about legislation uh, in this country. Uh, the religious right uh, has done, a, particularly the white religious right, has done a good job of uh, being clear on what their policy agenda is, uh, and the religious left uh, has not done as well uh, in in casting this moral uh, religious vision uh, that that 
affirms the things that, that we're uh, interested in. And I think that the black church uh, is the greatest weapon against white supremacy in America. We've not done a good job on uh, homophobia, heteronormativity. We don't do a good job on patriarchy uh, in terms of combating it. Uh, but we, 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 we are poised at this point to, uh, to really uh, attack white supremacy in some strong ways. So that's, 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 that's what we're doing at the BCC. That's, that's what I feel part of my life's call is. Is, is to be a theological resource uh, against, a theological resource for human dignity across all barriers and to fight white supremacy. Uh, I write, uh, writing is a, is a part of my call as well. Uh, so cultural commentary is the type of work I do. I, I, I'm a uh, opinion contributor for The Hill, uh, which is read by our uh, federal uh, legislators. So I get to talk to them fairly often. Nice. <laughs> And I'm Brianna Parker. I am uh, the professor, a professor of religion at Jarvis Christian College's Dallas campus. I'm um, the founding curator of the Black Millennial Cafe, which is a research and consulting firm. Um, I was the first person in the country to hold quantitative and qualitative data on black millennials and faith. And so I accidentally created the Black Millennial Cafe to do for us what Pew Research and Barna Group had not um, done. I also served the church for 10 years um, and that's where I learned marketing and administration and preaching and pastoring and all the stuff I need to do to be growed up. <laughs> um, yeah, that's where I cut my teeth and um, I was formed. I'm a southern girl, Dallas, Texas um, is where I'm from. My mother is from Grenada, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. My daddy is from Pineville, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, inform that informed not just my preaching, but my person. Um, justice wasn't an option in my home to even understand it. People were talking just about civil rights in school, but we were talking about justice in the home um, just because of what my family, had, what my parents had lived through. And so I think I bring a lot of that to uh, every space I'm in. And so I'm extremely grateful to be here that you would value us enough to not be notches on your belt as millennials. Mm -hmm. but to actually be a voice that could add to the treasure you're creating. Mm -hmm. And so I think I can speak for all of us and say we're honored, um, not just to be in your presence and have access in this way, but to what you um, think of us, think of our generation, think of our person, um, to be able to bring into this space. For sure. oh, thank you, thank you. Tell me some of the preaching mentors now that we have a call and now that we are headed towards seminary. Who are some of your preaching mentors? So I have many for different reasons. Uh, I can't ever not say Freddie Haynes, especially for style, right? Um, Dr. Claudette Copeland, oil. Dr. Gina Stewart, power. Uh, Dr. Billy Curtis, content. Mm -hmm. Dr. Raquel Letsom for precision. Mm -hmm. um, those are people I just, oh, and then Dr. Marcus Cosby for celebration. Mm -hmm. Like, I just feel like whatever he's gonna do, he can make you celebrate. Like, mm -hmm. he can tell me anything, <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh Lord Jesus. <laughs> and then just wait a minute, you know, cause you're gonna get to celebration. And uh, yeah, so I think those are some of mine at, at least. And then, and honestly, because I don't just flatter people, everyone here, you know, plays a role in that too. Like I, there's no one sitting here I haven't heard, appreciated, and felt like I should embody more of something that they have. So I even value the people here. Yeah. Yeah, my, my preaching mentors, right? We're talking about mentors? Yeah, my, my preaching mentors, uh, for, for, for different reasons, uh, uh, the most indelible imprint uh, on my preaching ministry is from my pastor, uh, the Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby. Um, who's the son of L.K. Curry. Who's the son we of should LK. just, yeah, yeah Chicago. Yeah. Um, Chicago. He was your pastor in Galveston? No, no, he's, okay. he, once I uh, was reclaimed, uh, recalled for the ministry, gotcha. I, I realized I needed to, 
to shift. And it was actually his model of, of, of ministry uh, yeah. that actually so restored images of, this is the dignity of what it means to be yes. a preacher, uh, okay. emerging this sort of intellectual acumen with spiritual depth. Uh, so he, he represented that, that for me and has, and has uh, had the, the greatest impact uh, on my, single impact uh, on my preaching. Um, my, in terms of theology, uh, it would have to be uh, Lawrence Edward Carter, Dean of the Chapel at, at Morehouse College, and uh, Michael A. Walren, uh, pastor of the First Corinthian Baptist Church. Uh, they have, uh, in, in very different ways, uh, help stretch how I, how I do theological construction formulation, how I, how I think about uh, theology uh, in an academic setting, but particularly Mike, uh, Pastor Mike, uh, what does it mean to do theology uh, alongside people in community? And how does that theology show up in your preaching? Uh, so that's why theology, to talk about these, the, how, my, how I preach theology works, those two are, are important for me. In terms of writing, uh, uh, have to be Martha Simmons. Uh, she is uh, she is my editor for almost everything. Uh, we co-authored a book together. Uh, she she is a mother uh, to me uh, in ministry, and it was actually because she published a sermon of mine in as she accepted a sermon of mine in the African American pulpit uh, that I that. I came to see writing as a part of my call, whether it is uh, writing sermons or writing op-eds. Uh, uh, she has served uh, that kind of uh, role for me in, in helping me think about how do I construct uh, a sermon? Uh, what do illustrations look like? How, how, how do you craft these things? So those would be, uh, and, and Dr. Freddie Haynes, of, of course, he, is, he was the, the first model that I had access to, that I was able to build a relationship with, who did social justice preaching, which was something I, I, I wanted to do, but had no, had no way of doing it, you know, uh, before really being engaged by him, you know, I had social justice content, but it wasn't prophetic sermon, you know, it was just rants, uh, you know? <laughs> but to think about what does it mean to, to cast moral vision from a liberationist lens, uh, yeah, he, he helps with that. I, I would say I've had maybe just a small handful of mentors, but like a pantheon of models. Um, in terms of mentors, I, I think of those who availed themselves to, to me and to advising and to teaching me and shaping me in some kind of way. And so first would be, of course, my, my spiritual mother, Pastor, Pastor C, and her husband, my, my bishop, uh, David, David Michael Copeland, both of them. And I think that just by virtue of pro uh, proximity, you know, they were my first kind of models, right, of that great, um, you know, homiletical tradition. Um, but my, uh, my grandfather, mm -hmm. um, Alvin Evans Sr., was kind of like a first mentor um, because prior to the whole shift in my mother's church membership, we would go and drive to Austin to his church, New Lincoln Missionary Baptist Church. And he was the first, you know, um, preacher that I remember ending every single sermon at the cross. <laughs> It did not. Somebody say yeah. <laughs> Every Sunday, right? And um, you know, I've I, you know I've since kind of teased at that a little bit, but I think he he um, preached in such a way and embodied that resurrection message in such a way, and celebrated in such a way um, that I really got to understand it very clearly. Like black preaching is different. It is categorically, quant quantitatively different um, um, from any other kind. And I, you know, I think about him as a mentor um, now because before he transitioned um, several years ago, um, you know, as he was transitioning, actually, we had a number of really amazing conversations because at that point I was his only grandchild that had accepted her call to ministry. And I think uh, her, being a woman, it kind of, maybe it threw him a little bit, but nevertheless, as he was inching closer to the Jordan, he, he taught me a couple of things and he, just remember him teaching me, um, he told me we were in the hospital and he said, you know, tell God's people this, that if you have the faith, God has the power. Mm. 
And he's like, just let that be your message that if God, that you don't need to do anything to help God, right. that you don't have to, you know. And then he was like, and you know, you can also sing, Nichelle, so you should try hooping in your preaching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, but I'm not a hooper, Papa. He was like, no, let's just try it. Let's just try it. <laughs> so I have these, these um, iPhone voice notes of my grandfather trying to teach me how to hoop. Mm. And I was like, it's not gonna work. I don't <laughs> hoop. He's like, just say early. And I was like, no. But it was precious. And I, it was um, the kind of time that no one else had taken out yeah. to, to actually mm. teach me, you know? Um, I am thankful for my homiletics professors, Leonora Tubbs Tisdale and Jennifer Brooks, um, um, because they, they, they taught me the theoretical um, structure that holds up preaching, right? Um, and introduced me to this kind of lineage of homileticians um, who took preaching really seriously. Um, Otis Moss III, I, I too worked at a church, um, Trinity UCC in Chicago for six years. And so three times a Sunday, I got to listen to one of my favorite preachers, my big brother in ministry, who um, who introduced me to um, liberationist preaching as um, as a formidable force for shifting hearts and shifting culture and shifting minds, because you can't shift policy if you don't shift minds first, right? And so, and shift hearts, and so he. Um, you know, just that model was, was, was really integral. Um, Yvonne Delk um, was a model to me as well and, and a mentor on several occasions. She was the first black woman to be ordained in the United Church of Christ, mm-hmm. which is the denomination I'm in now. Mm-hmm. And um, Pastor uh, Delk has just this way of preaching with with so much power and it's the kind of power to where you have to like kind of reflect on it. And then you're like, she just slayed me. (laughs) She really just slayed me. And um, just that kind of, uh, of a different kind of definition of, of of what it means to preach with power. Like it's, to me, in in her model, it's not always about the shout. It's not always about getting a reaction out of people. Um, but if you're really anointed and you're preaching under the power of the anointing, there's only so much that you have to do to be able to convey the point. And, 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 and if you are a willing vessel, the Spirit can do so much. And um, I learned that from, from Dr. Delk. I could go on and on with preachers who've influenced me, but those are some of the first to come to mind. I'm trying to winnow mine down here as, I I, as I'm so fascinated by all of the persons I've heard, I would, I got to meet Dr. Gardner Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I I would say he is one of the uh, major influences, mentors from a distance. I was first introduced to his preaching probably when I was uh, uh, 17 Mm -hmm. or so. And I would hope that there is a rhythm of not only intellect, but of vision in my preaching that uh, almost like a painter can stroke the brush and create on the canvas of the mind the beautiful, redemptive historical narrative in the way that he did. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you hear my preaching, hopefully you'd hear some of these strands through it. There's Gardner Taylor and then there's Donald Parson, um, who is a God-gifted preaching genius. And uh, there is a nexus of, uh, in his preaching of a vast vocabulary uh, with just some poignant insights that seem organic, uh, as it were. Uh, moving down the, uh, through there would be Dr. Ralph Douglas West. Mm-hmm. Uh, I call him Pontifex Maximus. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is, to me, uh, one of the, he's a living treasure. 
uh, the way that he combines scholarship, uh, uh, ethos, and pathos, just kind of all in that moment. And it doesn't take him long to do it. It takes me longer, but, but that's somebody I'm listening to every week. Um, Pastor James Meeks, Pastor K. Edward Copeland, for varying reasons. Pastor Meeks just has a way of saying stuff and it makes sense. Um, and, and then has an integrity, so to speak, that accompanies that preaching uh, that shapes the way that I talk. Pastor Copeland um, just helped me to be unafraid of my convictions and, and of the uh, scripture upon which my ministry would stand. Terry Owens is a name that needs to jump into, I think, more of our conversations. Terry's the general minister of the Disciples of Christ uh, right now. And she, and I, she was very much herself when she took the pulpit. And um, obviously very bright in the way that she would interweave scholarship and insight, but was uh, rather shepherding so to speak, uh, in her preaching. And uh, I very much enjoy listening to Dr. Gina Stewart and uh, to Bishop uh, Vashti McKenzie, but those are our influences. And then one more, uh, a, a white man, Pentecostal, R.W. Schambach. Uh, so if you've got the faith, God has the power. That's the first time I heard he would come on the radio every other night on WYCA in Chicago back in the day. and. Uh, and I think I got a little Pentecostal kind of, you know, uh, of, of that, that in me. But uh, those are names that come to mind when I think of who shaped me in that way. What are um, issues facing millennial preachers today? Definitely sexism. I say that because I think we're a generation who's decided to bring our entire self to ministry. Um, when I started preaching at 19, I would have to find suits with long skirts, you know, and do things that I would never do outside of the pulpit. I'm very free from that now, by the way. Um, but I think uh, many of my colleagues are. And so sex is for a number of reasons, but I do think millennial women are, and men probably too, we're bringing so much more of ourselves into our ministry. We're not divorcing our real life from our life as a preacher. That's it. Um, and I think that invites in sexism in ways that it may not have been before or that seems to be um, justified, you know? Um, almost like you wear it, you want it kind of thing. Or if not that, you wear it so you can't get the opportunity because it's just, it's too much woman. Too much woman. Um, mm -hmm. So that's definitely one. I would uh, drop in issues of uh, systemic injustice. I think in Chicago, particularly as is the case in a number of our major cities, there is this quest for ethnic affirmation apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ. I, and I, I don't think we have to search in places other than um, the personal work of Jesus Christ to get it. But the, what I sense is that some of the preaching that I do and some of the persons uh, that I'm connected to in the life of the church are trying to figure out what does the word of God have to say uh, to issues of justice in our world. And so uh, that's an issue that I don't think we have the luxury to dismiss. I want to piggyback onto Brianna's um, point of, of, of sexism, but also how what you've articulated is just this kind of, this generational tug of war um, where you're absolutely spot on. Like there's, we're not really willing to compromise our authenticity just to do ministry. Because yes, the person that calls us is gonna keep us, but the person who calls us calls us in our fullness. Mm -hmm. It calls us in, in, in the totality of who our creator has created us to be. Um, and I really think that the, the generational tug of war has to do, to me, essentially, around our theology about who we think God is. 
and how we talk about God, right? Um, and, 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 and who we understand God to have called, right? Um, because not only is God also calling people that don't have male bodies, God is also calling people who don't have male bodies, who have no problem standing in the fullness of our, our womanly bodies, right? And I don't mean um, uh, in a way of exposing everything, but I mean, you know, I'm going to talk about my experience as a black woman and I might decide that I want to wear a dress and I might decide that I want to wear some jewelry and I might, you know, and, and I don't have to. And, I, and why does that in so many settings and so many places preclude you from hearing what God is saying through me? Um, and I think that at the heart of these struggles, we're, we're implicit, implicitly saying that God can't speak through. So, so while they might allow you into their pulpit <laughs> and while they might extend the invitation for you to come, there's still um, this, this gendered hostility that makes some places downright volatile to stand in. Um, I think we also have this issue of technology um, and social media. Um, I, I want to give you all the kudos in the world for the work that you're doing Thanks, around Michelle. this. Um, but, you know, I, I do think, though, that what I don't know that this is any this is particular to our generation. This is just one vehicle of it. But it is really setting us up for this kind of celebritization of preaching and preachers. Um, like I said, I don't this is nothing new, but um, you know, but in one sense, it, the social media piece is new, though, in, in, right. the, in that no. sense. So I think you're right. right. But yeah, because you don't have to be in charge of it anymore. You know, yeah. when it was the media part of it. Right. Exactly. That's you were in control yeah. now, like you're saying, on social media. Yeah. I mean, you it's could, crippling sometimes, too. You could pay to get a thousand followers and you can pay and, and make it look like you have something substantive. I was looking at something about this, this young prophet somewhere. And I looked online and he has like this massive following of people. And, you know, and so I looked him up, you know, cause I'd never heard of him, you know, and I, I found his ministry and, you know, he's kind of up to kind of this prosperity, kind of laying on of hands, waving his suit jacket kind of ministry. Um, and there's a lot of people who are really into that. Um, but, you know, I think that if we're not careful with the, with the social media and we're not careful with the um, ready-made platforms, I think for some of us, um, I, it gives you more than what you're ready for. Mm -hmm. um, and it can't last. And it doesn't last. And, um, and there's a certain sense in which if you build that following, you've got to go out of your way to maintain it. Um, and so I've just seen some ugly things. And um, it's a challenge when, you know, you are a young person who wants to just do ministry from your heart and you have all these other people that are just like ready to sling blood, you know, and have Instagram and Twitter to do it with. You know, it's a challenge. I, I don't want to. I don't want to cut you off. I, I want to drop this in here in one sense for query. I struggle with how much to put on social media, mm -hmm. quite frankly, of of my preaching and of my ministry because I never want it to seem like I am broadcasting me. And the, herein is something different than I guess having a television program or radio program. And and yet there seems to me to be a lot of self-aggrandizement around this and maybe it's just my bent around our preaching on social media we don't we're, it's not per se that we're using it to ad advance the message so much as we are to advance person, the platform yeah, yeah. I, right. I think yeah I, I definitely struggle with how I'm, I'm, I'm not good at social media uh, I'm, I'm, I'm clear on that uh, there's a, a another underside to social media and because and I think m millennial preachers uh, can be vulnerable to, to this underside, mm -hmm. and that is the, uh, the, the penchant to compare yeah. one's life to, to what we, to 
people who are obviously broadcasting their best uh, and you begin to measure your real self uh, against a template that is intentionally uh, stellar and superb because yeah. nobody's really uh, broadcasting uh, all of the realities of their life. And so th there's something uh, I think dangerous about uh, only reading people's lives through social media uh, or, or to, to read your life through the lens of someone else's social media presence. Uh, because it's, it's you know, I, I have friends who, uh, probably more, more colleagues, you know, who can get down because who find themselves reaching emotional lows because of what they see other people achieving, the platforms that other people uh, have access to. And they spend so much time uh, scrolling, swiping, whichever way uh, to, to get to the next photo, swiping left, swiping left. Uh, and the more they swipe, uh, the more they feel inadequate. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that that's yeah. a, a feature of of social media that that's that's that can be dangerous for the mental health of of, of of our colleagues of our of, in our profession uh i also want to go back to this what, what i what i often think of as the authenticity gap i think that mm -hmm. our our generation has a tendency to be more authentic uh, more transparent uh, about various aspects uh, of their lives uh, and authenticity comes with cost in a prof in a profession like ours that is really you know where one of the first things they tell you is you know guard your witness uh, that's one of the first things I heard uh, and that comes with a lot of a lot of theological um, I guess I will say comes yeah, there's kind of this theological ecclesial respectability, politics of respectability, right, that exists in church, uh, where people actually don't feel comfortable being themselves. And, and I think our, our generation has a tendency to push up against that, to, to transgress uh, that, that kind of respectability politics that are, that are native to church. Uh, and, and I'm thinking now about, about two of my friends, uh, millennial pastors uh, who self-identify as, as queer, uh, and th they courageously do such, but because of that, uh, they feel locked out of certain aspects of ministry. And because they're not willing to, to rest free, to, to, to abandon uh, or obscure that part of their identity, you know, they, they, find ch they found churches. They, uh, they decide, I don't want to do uh, congregational ministry. Uh, and I think about what we lose, what the church loses, what the world loses, uh, because of how we marginalize uh, authenticity uh, in some ways. And I think another thing that millennials uh, are, are issues that millennials deal with, another issue that millennials deal with that we don't talk about very often, and that is suffocating debt. Uh, it is not cheap to get these educations uh, that, w that we have, uh, you know, and scholarships are thinning, uh, and so I, I can't even imagine uh, how expensive school will be for, for my nieces, uh, for, for my uh, future children, because I know how expensive it was, uh, it is for, for us, and to take that kind of crippling debt into ministry, uh, can create a, a, a host of resentments uh, toward uh, toward this profession, toward this work, because uh, churches only have uh, so much to give uh, to to sustain a pastor, to sustain uh, a staff. Um, also, the, the the types of compromises uh, that that we could possibly make in order to make a living. Uh, so, crippling debt is is another aspect of. This, the millennial in ministry that, that needs more attention. And the possibility of social media bullying, like we've also seen sermons that, I mean, like I can think of sermons that were not my best that I wouldn't want getting out or I didn't know any better, you know, so you say things before you know better. Um, and I always say, you know, your, you know, you have to protect things even in the infant stages, right? Because uh, once you make it to wherever you're going, people go find that baby. Um, and they will dig it up. Yes, and to have to suffer. I mean, people become household names for bad reasons, you know, for being like attacked. And so maybe none of you all do this, it, but I like, when I'm preparing to preach, I also have to go back and look through what could be a sound bite that could go left. I don't, other generations didn't have to do that. Now that's one thing I wish I did not have to do because it doesn't even mean everything you're saying is wrong, but that soundbite could just ruin you. 
And the truth of the matter, Brianna, is that you could edit for sound bites as much as you want. That's true. And someone with an agenda is still going to find one. That's true. And someone with the means and a platform to make you somebody's bad household name is going to do it. That's true. That's the way that sound bites work. I mean, I yeah. think about, you know, having spent that time at Trinity, you know. Um, that was a great sermon. It was. Right. It is a great sermon. Right. It's, an, it's a, an amazing sermon. And it's unfortunate that it was, it was sound, what, bitten that way. Right. <laughs> um, but what's even more unfortunate is, you know, how, how the church became stigmatized after that. And, sure. um, and, and Dr. Wright's ministry, his yeah. name, his scholarship, you know, I will forever ride or die for, for Dr. Jeremiah Wright, you know, and, you know, and, and for those of us who had that relationship and, and have that proximity or, or even without that, like, if you know the fullness of what he stood for and preached about, you know, you understand like a soundbite can't take away a, 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 a legacy, but it can make you miserable, yeah. you know, and, and I, you know, I just. M might I say this, and just in that one piece, it's, a, a soundbite is to make up a person's ministry, a soundbite which was said in a local church context, in a local moment, especially with a pastor and their people, uh, is to almost betray the way we're supposed to read the Bible. Um, that is to say, without the full context, without the appreciation of everything else going on around it, you can make something say what you want it to say Absolutely. all the time and not fully appreciate. And that maybe is, I mean, you know, we were joking about Insta stories before we, we came in. You only get 15 seconds yeah. on the thing, you know, unless you go live. And so we're living in 15 seconds and in 240 something characters mm -hmm. when, when really there's a lot more to be said and it takes much longer to understand what's, what's being said. But we're trying to winnow everything down into these small pieces, which isn't fair and isn't a way to yeah. interpret life. Yeah, and I, I, to have to think in sound bites, what does that do to the quality of, of preaching, to the depth oh, that one gets me. of preaching? Uh, I mean, that, that's, we've, we've adjusted to, to the culture that, you know, Twitter only has yeah. so much space. Yeah. Uh, and and right. to begin to think, to only think about sound bites, what does that do to the quality of, yeah. of preaching? Right, yeah. so which means you don't get time to build an argument across across time mm -hmm. yeah. so people many not all but will not allow you time to build an argument right. to to you know for it to this is david buttrick you know there's a moment when it forms in consciousness where you know what you've been saying for 25 minutes comes together and yeah, boom yeah, yeah, yeah. so when you take it in sound bites and pieces that's one of the things that i i really grapple with and frustrates me is that um i want to build an argument across time yeah you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to set a context, I want to develop an argument, I want to paint a picture, I want you to enter the story, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that takes time. Yeah. And when we soundbite, 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 or, you know, this whole piece where, um, you know, it used to be traditionally at the end, the celebration comes in at the end, mm -hmm. but now, you know, you five minutes in the sermon and the organ is right there, you know, right, on, right, on, on, right. so everybody's standing up on, on, everybody's standing up on point one. You know, <laughs> sit down, sit down, y'all making me nervous, right? You know yes. what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, yeah. when, I, when I critique sermons, I say stuff like, uh, I just did a couple last week. I mean, your illustrations are so wonderful, powerful, and long that they break down the overall message of the sermon. So people are, people are left with a piece of a sermon or an illustration rather than the text. Yeah. So yeah. I really, I really. It's tricky because while my edit saying, oh, I don't want anybody to get this part wrong. I know other people who edit and put in sound bites, you know, like make sure like they have these rhyming quotes and you know, there's a certain, like they're making sure they have something that's tweetable right. um, so that they have the opportunity to go viral so that they gain a greater following so that, you know, it looks like it was a kill, you know, so. So I wonder if the psychology of our culture has created an environment that forces preaching to move into that, that space. Here, here's what I mean. Uh, television, advent of 30 minute sitcoms with changing images every so many minutes and... Changing camera angles even, so mm -hmm. per second. Commercials, we, and, and for a generation that grew up watching television, I think developed a shorter attention span 
for sitting in a live space, hearing an orator, a preacher, a proclaimer, without all of the benefits of things shifting and moving. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder if that psychology is kind of inbred in a generation of Americans now mm -hmm. that can't sit for more than four minutes without kind of going to the phone or, I mean, it's amazing how many faces I see light up uh, from time to time. And not like facial expression, yeah, but like I mean like the, the screen. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so we were almost running against the normative way in which people have been raised these days because they interface with so much technology. And see, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm dialoguing with you. I, I think people hunger for depth, even if they don't know. Yeah. They're hungering for depth. Definitely. But life will present you a space where a sound bite don't work. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Life will, life will, I need a word. Right. A word, a whole word. A, a whole word. Mm -hmm. I, I need a fully mature, prayed over, exegetically sound, something that I can stand on. And so I think, and this just may be me, and y'all can push back on me, you know, I'm old school, but I, I, I just think we have surface, shallow preaching. So I use this analogy, and I say that when I, when I was uh, small, I ate the food that my mother gave me. Mm -hmm. Fried, you know, they used to put the, you know, they used to bake and grease in the beans. I mean, you know, all this stuff. But I'm grown now, so I can't eat that. Right. Now, what my mother fed me, she didn't feed me out of malice. Right. right. She, wasn't, she wasn't trying to be, she fed what she, and I think that people eat what they've been served. Mm -hmm. And they think it's good. You don't think your pastor's giving you unhealthy food. Until. Until. You happen to go to a better restaurant or sit at a different table. And sometimes that can be the awakening, you right. know? Mm -hmm. And you realize, oh, it doesn't have to be like this. So or some people sometimes think, oh, this is not the way it is. I want what I've had for so long. It could be unhealthy. It might not taste it. I mean, there. Or until you go through yeah, until life happens. Um, yeah. a cataclysmic event and find that what you've received is not sufficient mm -hmm. for your survival, your thriving, which induces then some crisis of faith, yeah. honestly, you know, it's just like, well, my religious leader has not led me well. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, where, where, where do I go? What do I do? You know? Yeah. I, I think there's the, the question of at, at what point uh, does, does, does the preacher, does the proclaimer decide that I can't feed people on a diet, I would, a theological diet I can't live on? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that kind of introspective piece that has to come Definitely. into into the sermon preparation process oh, that, that says, is this a word that I could actually diet on? Does, mm -hmm. does this sustain me? Does this stick to my bones mm -hmm. uh, at all? Or, or is it cotton candy? And if we don't, if, if our questions are always about applause and response, yes. right? Because it's so, it's so easy to, to become addicted to the antiphonal engagement in the congregation. It's call and response. You, you want to hear an yes. amen. Yes. When the reality is there's some words that I need that actually make me silent? Yeah. And how do I become comfortable actually thinking about my own theological diet when I'm preparing this homiletical meal for, for, for the people that, that I say I've been called to serve? So I'm, my argument is that millennials like depth like everybody else. I mean, so am I? Am I no, absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead, help me. Yeah, so I would, uh, I would say that I am working each week to preach, to plumb the depths as best as I can and to package it in as a palatable way as I can. Because I cannot deny uh, not only the way that I've been built, but the convictions that I have. One of the convictions that I have is that the Bible is not only a book that we interpret, it is a book that interprets us. And so there, there's a sense in which I'm trying to work my way through the passage that helps people to see that there are layers here, that there is more. And I, I'm certainly, for whatever my ministry is worth to the people who participate in it and have come, I am seeing younger people affirm the very thing you just said. They do want to hear something with, 
with depth. They do want to hear a word from God and not just something that makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. I do fundamentally believe that it is good news at the end of the day. So it will do all of these things. But at, but at the end of the day, the gospel is good news and we don't have to sacrifice that. And the other assumption we make, Dr. Thomas is, and, and to my uh, friends and colleagues here, is that uh, they're not thinking themselves. And they are thinking, mm -hmm. and, and many of them are thinking deeply about life and about their professions and the like. And so to show them from the Word of God that God has anticipated that and does speak to their spirit and their minds is a, a wonderful thing. One of the challenges when we're talking about depth um, of preaching is, as preachers, some of us lack the skill or the resources to go into our own depths. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about interiority. Yeah. I'm talking about um, mental health. Or analyzing motive, analyzing true motive. What's, what's my motive? Reason? But also in, I mean, I mean, I mean, in, in the depths of our own lives in in the lowest moments, right? When, when we also need a word, um, you know, I, I, I wonder if our, our lack of depth in preaching is correlated to our unwillingness or unskilledness at exploring the lowest of the low mm -hmm. and, and leaning into it and submitting to whatever's down in the pit, mm -hmm. if we're already in the pit, right? Um, I, I will never forget a sermon that I heard you preach um, called, Have You Been to God's Face? Um, I heard you preach that sermon at a time in my life where I was in the pit. And I just remember feeling that you were in there with me. And I had never experienced, I wanna say never, but I just remember in that moment feeling that it was such a unique experience, feeling like a preacher was coming down to where I was. Um, with the word, with, with, the, um, with the pathos of the word. Um, and, and I don't know that you could have accomplished that work without not just being in the pit, but you know, staying in the pit until the pit did what the pit was supposed to do in your life, even if, the pit, even if you were still in the pit, right? Um, but I think we stay on the surface because the surface is safe. Mm -hmm. You don't need therapy on the surface. Mm -hmm. You don't need good friends on the surface. You don't, you know, forgive me if I'm, you know, just doing too much. You don't need a glass of wine, you know, sometimes on the surface. Um, but when you start to get deeper and the, the emotions are more than you can handle on your own and, and, it's, um, and it is the miry clay. Um, how do you preach from there if you can't even go there, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think that's, that's it's the, for, the forgotten, that's a forgotten dimension of, of doing this work is uh, sort of mining the self, uh, mm -hmm. reaching for that interiority because some sermons are actually painful to write. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because yes. they're so honest yeah. and yeah. because it's such a clear mirror mm -hmm. to where I am and don't want to be, mm -hmm. who I am and don't want to be. Mm -hmm. And without the courage to go there, you know, uh, Phyllis Brooks, I think is the person that says, preaching is the communication of, of good news through personality or truth through personality. Uh, do we forget that we're people? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and what does it mean to feel and to sit in those feelings yeah. uh, and to follow those and to follow the lead of those feelings, you know, to some extent, uh, and not being afraid to go there, I, yeah. I think is, is, is important, just to, to echo what you were saying. I also wonder if there's a lack of depth uh, because we've forgotten that the preacher's an artist mm. and, and we have to package depth mm. in ways that are honest to the human experience, uh, but also palatable uh, for, for the human experience. Uh, have we forgotten that we're artists, that that's our job is to actually mm -hmm. make the profound seem simple, uh, to, to make the what is inaccessible accessible. Uh, uh, 
so I, yeah, I often wonder, have we forgotten that we're artists? I also wonder if we lack depth sometimes because we kind of sit in more comfortable places and we forget the great needs that are out there beyond our needs. Like, we're concerned with paying Sally Mae, right? <laughs> um, but there are other people who are concerned with paying $37 a month so that they can stay in their apartment. Mm -hmm. There are other people who are concerned with um, how to uh, take care of someone who is incarcerated and keep things running in their own home. And both of them are very uh, necessary because one keeps the person safe and out of trouble in prison and the other keeps you in your, you know, just, just, the, just the real, the realities of the world that we don't live in anymore. We just don't. I mean, we have to really spend time with people to be able to go to those depths. Oh, that's, yeah. And it's easy, you know, remember frangelism, like, you know, you have to go outside of your circle. It's, it's, it's not that easy from here anymore, you know? Um, when I go to the preaching moment, I take my sister who is deceased now. She died at 37. She was sick for 18 years of her life. Uh, she died of kidney failure. I mean, she suffered with kidney failure. She had two children. She was a single mother. She had a fixed income. Mm. She would leave church if she got discharged on a Saturday night or Saturday afternoon. She could be sick. She was going to church on Sunday. Mm. She saw any prophet who would come through town. Mm. So many pastors. Mm. Um, mm. Looking for spiritual food. Looking for it and uh, couldn't find it. And I remember uh, thinking sometimes when it was time for me to go preach, you know, would this word deliver Lisa? Hmm. Oh, wow. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. 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 You know, and sometimes they're not there. And if they are there, they're going to be ignored by what we say because we're just not thinking of them. Sometimes we lack depth because even in our messed up situations and even in the complex realities of the world we live in, we ain't, we ain't living like that no more. And sometimes our close family members are and we still don't even tap in there. You know, Do, are you spending time in the trap? You know, are you in Woodtown in Dallas, Texas, where they got, you know, uh, shoes on the line where they're like, oh my goodness, that's Reverend Bray, I love her. Do you stop and sit on the porch and spend, a time, spend enough time to know what's really going on outside of your cute, middle class, educated world? I don't know if we do enough. I think that's one of the main reasons why um, Many pastors told me that your church teaches you how to preach mm. because you have no choice but to live where they live. Uh, I mean, they, they carry, people carry so much uh, to the church. We, we, yes. we're, we're the catch-all profession. Uh, we are therapists, social worker, uh, financial planners. Uh, and, and because of that, there's a gift in that, is that it causes us to, to to remember the expansiveness of the human experience, uh, its highs, its lows. Uh, yeah. And a lot of preaching, at, at least in my experience, uh, uh, a lot of preaching has, to, ha has come from exegeting where people live, uh, exegeting life yeah. just as diligently and as faithfully as I'll exegete a text. Uh, yeah. and, th and that's important to do. And it's, and because of the celebrity nature of 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 our profession, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we we outsource some of the things that make our that can that make us great pastors. But we also, and in doing that, we outsource some of our preaching power yeah. because we don't get to see the text of people's lives when we don't do the hard work of showing up at hospitals, uh, listening to the same story that a, that a member has been telling you for 20 years and they haven't gotten it right yet. Like th th that's, that's preaching power comes from that. Yeah. And to outsource the pastor, to outsource pastoral responsibilities, we outsource some of our, we, we distance ourselves from where preaching ha happens and is needed. In my, in my preaching classes, at least some of them, every now and then I ask this question, you know, can you preach this at your mother's funeral? Mm -hmm. Not this word, but at the level. So if, 
if I'm preaching the word and I can't preach it at my mother's funeral, or why don't I start trying to get ready for my mother's funeral? I may be asked to preach it. Mm -hmm. And I got to have a word mm -hmm. for me, for the family, for me, for the fam, for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to say to people, okay, so let's get in the habit of this level of depth. And there's some arguments that you can't grow a church on depth. I happen to disagree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, absolutely. I think, I think, yeah. I think you can grow a church. I think it takes longer. I was about to say now. Does that mean grow a church yeah. or grow a church? Right. Exactly. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a scholar from the UK, can't remember their name. Uh, once said, you know, the difference between some of our preaching on our side of the pond and yours is you measure growth by size, we measure it by weight. Mm -hmm. And um, I have, I, I am seeing in Chicago, among other places, but how you can make it up and people flock in. Mm -hmm. And it's so unfortunate to some of the things, and you can catch it on YouTube or elsewhere, but it can be a temptation too mm -hmm. if, if one is not certain of the sense of call right. yeah. because it's so irresponsible. It's so outlandish. It's so shock value kind of preaching. Yeah. And yet people are coming in droves um, to hear it. So I, I agree with you. I think it takes longer, um, but it also takes an appreciation for what God is doing right. and, yeah. and not an assumption that you yourself grow the church. Um, but it, it is uh, Paul said it, some sow, others water, but it is God who yields the increase. And, and you know, I don't want to negate the place of easy surface preaching. Um, you know, I think we may have all had an experience or know someone who had an experience of being young in our faith and going to a church where you just need to hear, you know, some introductory preaching um, that gives me a way to enter into this, this lifestyle, this narrative of, 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 of being a Christ follower. And, and you don't always do that by jumping straight into the, de the depths. Um, and so I, I think about a couple of different churches in my life, um, you know, both, you know, just as, a, you know, a, a Christian and, and also in places where I've preached, um, where I, I got the sense this is for, this is, this is a church for, you know, milk level Christians. And I think that that's legitimate. Um, and I, and I, and I remember, you know, at, at certain points, particularly when I was in, 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 in living in, in other cities and, you know, for school or whatever, where it was clear, like, okay, I've outgrown this. I need, I need to find a new place. Um, and then you do what you have to do. And, and I think that, I, I totally feel that. I, I think the distinction that I would like to make is that if it's true, um, yes, introductory, so forth and so on. Some of the stuff I'm hearing is just not true. Sure. It's, yeah. it's not responsible and yet, People want it to be true. There, there's that George Bernard Shaw quote that God made us in his image and we return the favor. That, that our preaching is reshaping God in the minds of people because that's the God that they want. And so they're coming to hear as consumers what they want, not because it's, it's true.